morning. Good morning. Good. Good, morning. Good to see everybody on a cloudy, rainy morning. Did anybody have any trouble getting out besides me? Me. <laughs> yeah. A little bit rough this morning. And the thunder and rain last night kind of woke me up. And then it was hard for me to, to wake up. The alarm went off at 6.30 and I was like, uh-uh, ain't done it. <laughs> so I turned it off and went back to sleep. Oh, goodness. Well, I'm glad you got up. I'm glad you're here. I think uh, we've got a good message this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break off of 1 Peter for a few weeks and kind of dive into the Christmas season and today, next Sunday, and then Christmas Day. We're going to have church uh, Christmas Day, Christmas morning at 10 o'clock, same time. And so I'm going to spend the next three weeks just kind of talking about uh, having some Christmas messages and uh, how uh, we can kind of get into the Christmas spirit. If you're not already in it, uh, but uh, anyway, we'll start back in, in First Peter uh, next year. <laughs> How's that next sound? Year? So uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, glad you guys are here. Uh, another announcement, real quick, is that this Wednesday uh, we're going to have movie night uh, here, and so invite you to come to that. It's going to start at six o'clock, and we're going to have a nacho bar, and so um, we invite you to come and be a part of that, and just have a fun evening of watching a, a Christmas movie and. Just enjoying fellowship and enjoying one another and just having a good time together. So I invite you to uh, to come and be a part of that. Six o'clock right here, Wednesday night. And come with an appetite. And so uh, I invite you to come to that. All right, so uh, the title of the message today is The Star Still Shines. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the star of Bethlehem. You heard about that? Yeah. And uh, the power that's behind that and, and, the, and the, the prophecy that's behind that. And then how that, does that apply to us today? Is, is, there, is there an application that we can take away from the star of Bethlehem? So I have a question for you. Have you ever been lost? Anybody in here ever been lost? Uh, we were just talking to Lainey just before service. How she and her crew kind of got lost uh, yesterday in the race. And so, But have you ever been lost? And I'm talking like deep into thousands of acres of woods lost. Yeah. Yeah, you probably enjoyed that, don't you? <laughs> well, I've been lost a couple of times in my life, and that feeling that you get. The first time I was lost, I was in elementary school, and I just was scared out of my mind when I got lost. I was at the, in, in Tulsa, uh, every year they have a boat sport and travel show that comes to town at the fairgrounds, and it's in this huge expo center and so my family we always went up there and, and looked at all the things that we could never have <laughs> you know have fun going through the rvs and climbing in and out of all the boats and all those things and just a good time to to see what the rich people get to play with and so we went in there and just and, and we were and i just remember we were we were around this one boat just just looking at it looking around it and the next thing i know i'm the only one there still looking at the boat Everybody else had, had wandered off, you know, and I'm, I'm looking everywhere. And there's these, I mean, these boats are this high to an elementary school kid, right? I can't see over anything. And uh, so they're gone. The family's gone. And I'm like, what on earth am I going to do? So, I, so there's, there were two levels to this, this uh, expo center. And so I, I uh, climbed up the stairs to see if I could look down and see anybody. And I, and there's people everywhere at this place everywhere and so i couldn't find them but you know lo and behold we got reconnected and but that that rattled me and uh the second time was early on in our marriage and i got to go hunting deer hunting for the first time first time i've ever been deer hunting in my life and they go to this place it's a public public place thousands of acres of public land that you can go and hunt on and it's just it's just 99.9 percent .9 woods Right, the, the road going in is the only place that you're not going to find trees. And so we get in there, and, and it's, they, they go there all the time. They, they, they go there year after year, so they know every, every tree in there, that they all look the same to me. Right, but they know where they're at. And so we get back in there. We drive deep into these woods to the place where we're going to be. And this is an afternoon hunt. We're hunting in the afternoon. And so we start walking down this trail, I guess. And they're like, okay, you go that way. So we were up on a, on, a, on a ledge and it kind of went down. And they wanted me to kind of sit on that ledge looking down. So I like, okay. So I veered off and went off by myself. <laughs> right? And in these woods I've never been to. 
So I go down and I just park myself and start looking, you know, watching for demons. Well, they, they go on down. They go on down the trail. I don't know where they went, how far they went. Well, I'm sitting there. And it's getting later in the day. You know, the sun's starting to go down. I'm in these trees. It's getting darker than probably that it really was. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I guess they're going to come back and get me. Well, it just keeps getting darker. And I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's past hunting time right now. I mean, you're not going to see anything. Uh, and so I, when I, when I say I, I walked, it, it was probably a good 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards down there where I went. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going I'm to go back up to where I was and just wait. Well, let me tell you, I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And it got dark. I mean, it was pitch dark. All right, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're not going to be able to fight me. I'm in these woods where I have no idea where I'm at. I have no idea where the road is or anything. And I'm just here by myself. What, what in the world am I going to do? I was lost. I was lost. And finally, looking down the, the way there, I see these little bright little lights on, the, on, the, on their head. We had these little lamps on our on our heads, on our hats, and it's like, oh my goodness, there's the light, I see the light. Amen. I was so excited when I saw those lights coming toward me, and then, then, you know, one light turned into two lights as it got closer, and I was like, all right, I'm, I'm saved, I'm, I'm saved, the, lights, the light has saved me, and so I was able to get out of the situation, but again, that did something to me too, that was, that was, that, 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 that traumatized me a little bit, I, I do not like being in a place that I'm not familiar with my surroundings. I, I can't stand being lost. And so for a long time, when we would drive back up to Oklahoma, you know, we'd have to have the maps on so she could tell us where to turn and this, that, and the other rule. Well, real quickly, I, I figured out how to do it without maps. I, I, can, I can get there without, and there's lots of turns. If you, if you take the way that we go, there's, there's lots of turns between here and Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, uh, but I learned real quickly uh, how, to, how to navigate that trip without maps, without the lady telling me where to turn. And, uh, and it's, it's gas stations, it's uh, restaurants, it's stop signs, it's stoplights. Listen, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm going somewhere, I'm looking around at everything. <laughs> Because I want to know where I'm at. If in case I ever have to do this again, or if I ever have to go back, I was like, okay, that's Sonic, I got to turn there. Okay, that stop sign, I got to turn there. You know? So I'm, I'm always looking at my surroundings. I'm always looking for those things that, that are familiar, that can become my guide to my destination. So I, I don't need maps. I, I, I know where to go. I know how to get to where I'm going. Well, so for years, generations, generation upon generation upon generation, the world had been looking for the sign that would reveal the Messiah. Right? So we're going to talk about the star of Bethlehem today. And for generations before that period of time, before the birth of Jesus, the world had been looking for that light. That was never going to, that, that, that was taken years and years and years and years before it would ever show up. So for generations, they've been waiting for this, this, this sign to reveal the Messiah, the Messiah. And only the Magi got to see it. These, these wise men, these, these astronomers were the only ones that were allowed to see this light. So I want you to look at a picture. I, I, I put a picture up here. I want you to look at this picture and, and uh, kind of study it just for a little bit. You've got, you've got that's Mary sitting down. That's, that's the infant Jesus on her lap. And then you've got the three wise men that are bringing their gifts. And then you've got that little star up there. And then you've got this guy. Y'all can't see it, can you? Got this guy standing behind Mary, pointing to the to the star. Well, what's what's going on here in this picture? Well, back in, in 1967, I think it was 1967, 
a discovery was made. This, this, this picture was discovered in a catacomb, which is a, an underground cemetery. It's, it's got tunnels and, and rooms to it where, where uh, they, they would bury their dead underground. And in one of the rooms, uh, this picture was found on the, on the wall. And uh, it dates back to the 200s. All right? And so that painting right there, uh, the, the, that, that's not Joseph. Right? That's, that's, anybody ever heard the name Balaam? Heard of Balaam's donkey that, that could talk? Right? You remember that story? You heard about that story? That's Balaam. That's Balaam that's pointing to that star. And, 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 and this is a prophetic picture. That's the star of Bethlehem that Balaam is pointing to. He's a Gentile. He's not, a, he, he, he's not a, from, the, from the tribe. He's not from Israel. He's not from the, from the nation of Israel. So what's the significance of this picture? We're going to talk about that, but I want to read the, the story of the star of Bethlehem and, and, the, and the Magi's journey to the, to the baby, uh, to the infant Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I say infant because uh, we're going to discover in these, in these passages right here that Jesus is probably between the ages of 1 and 2. He's, he's, not, a, he's not a newborn baby at this time. He's a little bit older, and, you'll, and we'll see why. Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 1, says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So they saw this star. Now, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a debate out there on whether this is a, an actual star or if it's a comet, or if it's a, a, a special aligning of, of Jupiter and Saturn, they, they just aligned just right, which they did, I think it was in AD 6 or 7, that, they, that this happened. And so, they're trying, there's, a, there's a debate out there about what this actually is. But the scriptures call it a star. We, see, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And verse 3 says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. All Jerusalem. Every one of them. All Jerusalem with him. They didn't get to see the star. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them. They saw it again, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I, I know that feeling, right? When I, when I saw that light, I was overjoyed too. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned, warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now we know in the next couple of verses, Herod gets pretty upset by the fact that they tricked him. They didn't go back to him and let him know. And so he gets, he gets mad. He gets angry. And he orders all... Uh, infants two years and younger in Bethlehem and, in, and around that area to be killed. Because he wants, he, he doesn't want anybody to take his place. He doesn't want anybody else to be king. He's the king. And so he wants this Jesus, who everybody else is saying he's going to be the ruler, he's going to be the king, he wants him dead. And so that right there gives us an idea of about how old Jesus probably is at this part of the story 
uh, that we're reading. He's probably between the age of one and two. But the star was their guide to the Messiah. All right? The star was their guide to the Messiah. That, that star, oh, it's, it's gone. But that star right up there is the, was, the, was, the, was the sign that was going to lead them to the Messiah. Now, it's interesting that no one else saw it. Or if they did, they didn't pay any attention to it except for these Gentile astronomers. <laughs> And that's interesting, and that, that kind of brings us back to, to Balaam. Why is Balaam in the picture? So to, to, to understand and to understand that, that picture, we've got to go back thousands of years before the birth of Jesus. To the time where the Israelites were making their way to the promised land. All right, they're, still in the, they're still in the wilderness. They're, they're on their journey to the promised land. That's how old this prophecy that I'm about to read to you is. It's thousands of years before Jesus is ever on the scene when this prophecy pops up. So Balaam, he's, a, he's a, what, they, what they call a diviner. He, he, he's one that would come and, and place a curse or a, a blessing on your life. And so Balaam comes from the, from the nation of Aram, uh, around the Euphrates River, and he's been hired by Balak, who is the king of the Moabites, to go and place a curse on these Israelites that are making their way into the Promised Land. They don't want them there. All of those surrounding nations did not want the Israelites to come and, and to take possession of the Promised Land. And so they wanted to stop them. And so one of the ways that they tried to stop them was to send this guy Balaam and his donkey to go and place a curse on the Israelites. Well, little did, well, the, the, little did they know that God was on the side of the Israelites and instead of Balaam placing a curse on them, God turns it around and uses Balaam to bless them. So it backfires on them. In fact, uh, Balaam was so, he so wanted to place a curse on them that his own donkey wouldn't let him go. His own donkey, God gave the ability to speak and to, and to keep him uh, from, from, from speaking any kind of a curse on uh, the people of Israel. Let me read it to you. Numbers 24, verses 15 through 17 gives us a couple of verses. It's, 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 if you want to read the entire uh, story, it's Numbers 22 to Numbers 24. And, and it gives the entire blessing. But here's the, here's the part that, that uh, we're going to look at today. Uh, chapter 24, verses 15 through 17. Then he spoke his message. Balaam's getting ready to speak his message. The prophecy of, of Balaam, son of Beor. The prophecy of one whose eyes see clearly. The prophecy of one who hears the words of God who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are open. Verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star, a star, will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the people of Shep. And that's where this picture is this, it comes from. It comes from that prophecy that a star will come out of Jacob. That's not the only catacomb where that painting is found. It's, it's found throughout the catacombs of that area. It's found in many places in that area. In fact, that prophecy, this prophecy that I just read, is one of the most frequently quoted Messianic texts. A star 
who will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And from that moment, for thousands of years later, they've been waiting for this star to come out of Jacob. They've been waiting, wondering. And then when it comes, nobody sees it. Nobody recognizes it. Except for a few wise men, except for a few astronomers, Gentiles. So God uses a Gentile to prophesy the coming of the Savior and gives Gentiles the first opportunity to come and worship Him. I, I, don't, I don't know how that strikes you, but that strikes me as, wow, that, that, that God, way back at the beginning of time, had a plan for you and me to be saved. Because we're Gentiles, you and me. We're Gentiles. And from, from this prophecy from day one, he used the Gentile to say, look, one day there's going to be a star that's going to appear and it's going to lead you to the Savior. And nobody in Jerusalem saw that. What? Deuteronomy chapter 23. This is a, this is a little bit deeper into to, to, uh, Balaam. Uh, Deuteronomy 23 verses 3 through 5. This is God speaking. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the tenth generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor from Pethor in Aram, to announce a curse on you. I love this verse. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord God, the Lord your God loves you. He would not allow Balaam to do what he was sent there to do. Instead, it was the exact opposite. This, this, this Gentile who's coming to curse the Israelites now comes to bless them. And not just bless them, but give them the prophecy that, hey, Jesus is coming. That this, this diviner that, that hates them is now blessing them and announcing the birth of Jesus is coming. You're going to see a star that's going to lead you to Jesus. The Savior of the world. <coughs> Isaiah 49, 6 says this, I will make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. We've been a part of God's plan all along. Amen. All along. He's, he's wanted to, to bring Gentiles into the fold. To be our shepherd too. Acts 26, 22 and 23 says, I, this is Paul, teach nothing except what the prophets of Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead as a light to Jesus and Gen to Jews and Gentiles alike. So Jesus is our light too. He's that light that's coming that when we're lost and we don't know what to do or where to go. We just stand still and, and, and eventually we're going to see that light coming to get us. He's, 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 a, he's chasing after us. He will find you. So Jesus is the light. He's the sign uh, for salvation for everyone. And so how does this, all of this that we've just read about, how does this impact me? How does this have relevance for today? Well, number one is this. Jesus is the only way to salvation. He is the only way. He is the only light worthy of chasing after, of going toward. And number two is this, that you and I, are to shine like those stars, pointing people to Christ. 
Look what Philippians chapter 2 says, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Listen to this. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. As you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I would be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. You and I were born to be stars. Amen. You and I were born to, to shine brightly in a dark world. This world is lost. They're, 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 they're thousands of acres deep into the woods on a dark night. They don't know what, they don't know how to get out. And we get to bring our light to them at, at work, uh, on, the, on the ball field, in the neighborhood. We get to shine like stars in the night. We get to point people to Jesus. Some of the signs that we have are creation. We can look around. The Bible says that we can look around and we can know that there's a creator. We, we, we can know that, that, uh, that, there, that, that this Jesus that we read about in Scripture is real. We, another sign that we have is His Word. We can, we can read through His Word and we can read prophecies like this one, uh, how they came true thousands of years later. There's, there's other prophecies that have come true. So we have His Word that, that's a sign for us that, that, that this is true, that this is real, that Jesus is our Savior. Uh, another sign that, that the world has is there, there's church buildings all over the place. You, you can't drive down a street without seeing a church building. And hopefully that church building is, a, is, a, is, a, is an eye-opener to them to, to, to think about spiritual things. Think about Jesus. That, that, that church building is a, is a star. It's a, it's a beacon. It's a, it's a bright light where people can come and find Jesus Christ. Then finally, the, the world, they, they, they can see us as bride, believers, our testimony. And Philippians talks about the way that we live our life. The way that you and I live our life is a, is a, is a, is a beacon for the lost world. And so for a world that was looking for the sign for the Messiah to come and it showed up in a, in a bright light in the sky... That led them to Jesus. Now there's, there's millions of bright lights all over the world that are carrying Jesus within them, the Holy Spirit within them that are, that are, that are guiding people to Jesus. So that star that, 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 that led the Magi to Jesus is still the same star that, 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 that in us that will lead people to Jesus. The Bible goes on to say, it says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Over and over again, he's using this, 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 this sign as a bright light, a star, a shine like stars. Let your light shine, so shine that, that people will see your good deeds. Because people are attracted to light. People are scared of the dark. Especially when they don't know where they are. But people are attracted to the light. And so you and I get to be that light that's attractive to a dark world. We get to be lights that point a lost and dying people to salvation. Just like the star of Bethlehem pointed people to the birth 
of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Be the star that points people to Jesus now, today. So my encouragement to you is, my application to you is, is to do that, is to shine. The way that you live your life depends on how bright you shine. Right there. If you ever look up at the dark night, you can see some stars that you can barely see. They're dim. And then there are stars that you can see really well. They're bright. And the way that you live your life determines on if you're going to be a dim star or you're going to be a, a bright star. And so I, my challenge to you is do what you have to do to be a bright star. Change what you have to change in your life. Uh, remove things in your life that, that, are, that are causing your light to be dim so that your light can shine brighter. To do whatever you have to do to, to brighten uh, the, the, your light. And then go out there and, and show the lost world the way to the right destination, the way to, to Jesus. I think they're looking. I think they're looking in the wrong places. I think they're looking at the wrong things. But I think they're looking. And the brighter that we can shine, the, the more attractive that we're going to be, they're going to follow. They're going to come. So do whatever you have to do to make your light shine brighter. Let's get it back ahead and close your eyes. And just ask this question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? <coughs> think about your life. or Think about uh, the brightness that you are. Are you a, are you a dim star? Are you a, are you a bright, beautiful, attractive light? that people can come to to find Jesus Christ. You and I are that star. We're that star today that's, that's leading people to Jesus Christ. Let's be as bright as we can possibly be. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this message, God. I, th I thank you for this, this story, this, this prophecy that that was, that was given so many years ago, almost back to the beginning. That was fulfilled by the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. That star that shone over Bethlehem, that showed those magi where to go to find you. I'm so thankful today, Father, that there are, there are stars all over the place. People that, that have given their life to you. That have, that have surrendered their life to you. And now have this beacon inside of them. This, this light inside of them. That, that's out there to, to shine for all the world to see. That points to you. So, Father, for all of us in this room, we, we, we are that light. And I pray, Father, that you will just speak to us right now. Father, is there, is there areas of our life that are keeping us from being bright? Are we dim? Are, we, are, we, uh, are there things in our life that are keeping us from being a, a, a brighter light for you? Because I think all of us in this room would, would agree that, that we, we want to be that bright, shining light that all the world sees and glorifies you. So, Father, help us to do whatever we need to do to be the brightest star that we could be to point people to you. I'm asking you to stand. I'm asking our altar team to make their way up and